new ways of, of looking at things that uh, we in the performance team love. So, Dario. Go okay. Ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me here. It's very, I'm really thrilled. So, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to bring basically two viewpoints. I've been working on academia for the last 15 years or so. Uh, and then last year I moved to Huawei. So, I basically have uh, industrial viewpoints with a uh, university mindset. And so today what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, talk about metrics and models for web. And there's a little longer subtitle that I'm not going to comment here. We're going to see uh, through how things evolve. So of course this work would be not possible with a number of people if they are in alphabetical order. Uh, two are actually in the room. One is Gilla Dubuc from Wikimedia Foundation. The other is Flavia from Telecom Polytech. Uh, so thanks with, uh, to them, we also uh, can discuss more interesting things now. So just to set about what we're focusing on, I mean, we're, I'm not a web developer, so I'm going to have a completely different focus. And right now I'm working on an equipment vendor, so I will have a very much lower layer focus. So no matter what you're working on, if you're a browser uh, maker, if you're a, con uh, a CSP content service provider, if you're an internet service provider or an equipment vendor, what you care about is that the user are happy, right? So offer quality of experience is a common goal. And of course, if you, something doesn't go uh, uh, bad, so if something goes bad, you want to be able to detect it fast. Uh, if possible, if you want to, also to be able to forecast before things go bad. And if you're good at forecasting, you could also try to prevent things from going bad in order for your user not to churn. So detecting quality of degradation, quality of experience degradation is important. Now, how do you detect quality of experience and how you define it? Well, typically, you would need to have a good idea of how the user, if they are happy or not, and then try to correlate uh, some of the telemetry. So, like, for instance, the boomerang uh, is collecting a lot of telemetry, and we'll try to correlate that with the user quality of experience. Now, if you're taking the point of view of equipment vendor of internet service provider, well, you're going to have a little bit harder time because you're not in the browser. So you don't have all the rich telemetry. And encryption now is really, uh, is really going to be painful, because you're gonna only going to see stream of encrypted traffic. Still, we want to do something, because otherwise, your user will churn. If the user will churn, the equipment vendor will not be able to sell equipment. And so uh, there's a, a loss uh, of money as well. So it's important to get a hand on what's the quality of experience. And user quality of experience is basically affected by a lot of things including, for instance, the context. So where is the user, work, uh, other places. Uh, if he's a pessimist guy or if it's uh, an old lady, probably they don't have uh, in excessively the same perception of delay. And there's, all, of course, system influence factor. If you are downside in the building, ground two or minus two level floor, probably your signal is not very good, so we have slow performance. So in order to factor all those stuff, being an engineer, of course, you're going to ask the user, but you're going to try to infer these things from looking from the system perspective. So system perspective starts from the lower layer, the network. So over there, you will be able to measure some quality of service indication. These will, in turn, affect uh, application performance, uh, application metrics, application QoS metrics, like the one that uh, Boomerang was reporting, or uh, other, uh, like web page tests, are reporting to use some telemetry. And from that, it will have an influence on the way in which the user are experiencing their browsing behavior. And so uh, what you're going to do is that you're going to be able to measure some of these metrics, like uh, from an end-to-end -end viewpoint, what is the latency, what is the bandwidth, what is the packet loss, or point-to-point, -point, uh, what is the Wi-Fi quality. Of course, that doesn't make sense if you look at the throughput of a single connection, because you want to put them all together in order to be able to tell meaningful metrics from a session viewpoint. Session means, for instance, if you're looking at uh, a web application, it's going to be page load time or speed index that we're going to see later. There are also session metrics that are correlating measure about multiple sessions. So for instance, engagement. So me measuring if you're staying on a website for long means that you typically would uh, are happy with the quality of experience they're serving. Uh, and of course, you can go and readily ask the user how he feels about uh, the service you're giving him. So that you can ask many user, poll around the room, you get five stars, and then you do the averages, you mean your opinion score, you can also ask a different thing. And of course, if you know about the device type, if you have a cheap phone or if you have a high-end phone, maybe your expectations are different, maybe the phones are also rendering uh, differently. So all of that, of course, is very complex. So today, we're going to focus on a subset of it. In particular, we're going to look at the web. Uh, that's the web dev room. So we're going to look into performance metrics like page load time speed index, try to see how this correlates with uh, the mean opinion score or user, other user feedback. And of course, we're also going to adopt uh, the viewpoint of the lower layer carriers. 
where they are only going to be able to measure some weak signals. They don't see anything about the middle layer because it's quick, HTTPS, or whatever other kind of encryption. And so they either want to try to, uh, from the network QoS, learn something about the application QoS, or make a big step and go to the quality of experience of the user. So that's basically the agenda for today. So they're going to delve into four different uh, aspects, uh, data collection, so the modeling parts, the metric parts, and then again, uh, some method that allows you to go from raw uh, to, to a pop. So we have a path. Uh, if you are from the Netto, you need to start uh, with your method, uh, learning something which is metrics uh, about uh, that the browser can easily measure. You need to learn the metrics that are useful. So for doing that, you need to couple two things. You need to couple measurement involving the user, asking user whether they help you or not, and building models that, based on your metric, uh, are hopefully able to uh, extract this information from automatically collected one. So in the agenda today, we're going to work this top down. So we're going to start with uh, with the data collection. So data collection, typically what you do is that you build up some uh, crowdsourcing campaign. They have a huge cost, uh, and they, have, they are no perfect campaign. In the last years, we have been doing three types of different things. We have been asking user, what is the mean opinion score? So write your experience from one to five. Uh, we have also been asking user, when do you think that the page was finished? Or what is your user perceived page load time? Or seeing two pages at the same time, which page did you think it finished at first? So to get a little bit uh, an idea of how the user are perceiving the web. And finally, with Wikipedia, in a living collaboration with uh, Wikipedia, we started asking the user whether they are satisfied uh, with the uh, experience they have while browsing Wikipedia. So of course, there's no uh, per se solution. In the first data set, we were doing lab experiments. This means that we were having a few uh, panel of people that were typically volunteer, uh, close to 150 to 150 people recruited to university. So you have very specific class of population. It will definitely not fit the grandma's behavior. Uh, we're, the good side is that we were using real servers, real protocols. We were able to control the conditions. Uh, but the number of web pages, of course, is not as completely representative of the internet. So then you can do something else, stepping up by moving to crowdsourcing. So you have, for instance, Amazon Mechanical Turk, Mechanical Turk, so you can leverage a large pool of people. But over there, you need to, you, you cannot let them access a web server, so you will typically put videos of the web page rendering process. So this is not really exactly like browsing. Uh, you reach a larger audience, but this audience also interested in uh, getting paid for, for the task. And so you need to filter out a lot of uh, uh, people that are just uh, there to make money. Uh, so Last thing that we did with Wikipedia is very interesting because we have actual the, we are polling the user, so there's one billion uh, pages visit monthly, uh, roughly, and a tiny fraction of that is going to be polled uh, for performance metric, and a tiny fraction of that is going to also be polled for uh, binary feedback, so it's slightly more than binary feedback about whether they were happy or not. So this is good because you're going to poll users that are in the real service from the service they like, the service they use typically. The downside is that you have a huge heterogeneity. Remember, on top of my head, that we were polling on 65,000 people. Uh, they, had, they were looking at 42,000 different Wikipedia pages, 3,000 uh, networks uh, of uh, 250 devices, and 45 browsers. So there's a lot of heterogeneity, and so building a single model is not necessarily uh, trivial. When I'm putting the icon there is that the data sets are available. So uh, if people are interested, if there are people that are doing research on that, uh, like we were saying before, uh, sharing tools is important. Sharing performance uh, in, uh, uh, evaluation is important. Sharing the data is even more important because it allows you to replicate and see whether the performance that are reported are true or not. Uh, so now that you got the data, OK, cool, what do we do? Well, basically, we're going to have a way to go from the data, so our, our Y, to find some function that, based on some of the things that we are able to measure, like our incognita uh, Y, uh, plug into a formula F uh, is going to be able to tell us what is magically, if you want, the, the user uh, performance. So here, by X, typically people use a single scalar metric, generate the page load time. The function has been predetermined by an expert. And there are typically two approaches that are being used. One is an IQX hypothesis. We are using an exponential model. And here, with a logarithmic model, which is tied to the weber fechner law, uh, which is a psychobehavioral model that tells that the human response to a stimulus is logarithmically related. And this is, for instance, uh, used by a standard. So what you do, you do, you do a lot of measurement. All the points here are different answers from the different user. And then you do a fitting. And here, the fitting, you, we can be 
uh, happy with that. Now there are limits because typically uh, there are a lot of metrics, a lot of telemetry that is uh, made from browsers, and so here we are only using a single metric. So you can go one step further, and instead of picking a single metric that you like and a single function that you like, and although the fitting seems nice, you could do something which is uh, machine learning driven. So basically having a factor of input features and having an automated way to select what is the optimal fitting of the function by minimizing some error. So here the trick is that whenever you select a ver very specific machine learning algorithm, you're implicitly selecting which are the type of function that you will go able be, uh, to learn. And here you see that you have a slight gain with respect to the type typical uh, models that you, you have here by considering more metrics. Of course, there are different models that are available. We're not going to delve into the detail of that. Uh, just to say that for me, there's still some room for improvement from going to the feature that we have to the user experience. But still, you have a good and, and quite high correlation. So this brings us to the metric. What are the metrics that we can work on? So in order to uh, be quite clear about everything, I'm going to have a very small animation about how is the web page loading process after you go and click on a link. So we start something that you're going to start downloading, and at some point, you will have an event that is going to be fired by the browser, uh, document object model. So at, at this point, you know the structure of the page, and you can start uh, putting things around. And so you have a visual progress of the page that increases from zero to uh, upward. Then you keep downloading more things until at some point, which is called typically above the fold, all the, portion of the, all the visible portion of the page has been downloaded and shown to the screen. That's called the IATF and your visual progress is increasing. And you can represent here your visual progress as a function x of t that is growing from 0 to 1, where 1 is basically everything that needed to be rendered for the page to be visually complete is finished. So x of t, of course, you can also do something a little bit more fancy. So basically here, the integral of the residual of this uh, function is the area, the gray shaded area above the curve. And this gray shaded area above the curve is what uh, Google defined the speed index. So we're going to come into that in a moment. And then, of course, I mean, you can keep downloading more content that is not necessarily available and immediately visible, but it's going to be available when you scroll. And that's when all the content is loaded, it's typically the page load time. So now we have two types of metrics. So one are the time instant metrics. So you have, for instance, time to the first byte, DOM, time to the first paint, about default, page load time. These are very specific time, which are important to somebody. And then you have something else, which is the integral form of it, which is basically uh, looking at all the area above the curve. So why this thing intuitively is important? Imagine that you have two realization of two pages uh, that have exactly the same page load time. So they finish exactly the same time, but this one shows half of the content very fast, and this one shows half of the content almost uh, uh, much more later, right? So in which of the two you would be happier? In this one. So whenever the area above the curve is smaller, then it's better and it's faster. So one additional comment is that Given that you are integrating something that is adimensional, I mean, integrating over time, also the air above the curve is a time in, in dimension. So physically, if you are an engineer, you would think that of a time. It's a time unit of measure, and you can think it as a virtual time that is re, uh, explicitating how fast was the, the, the rendering process. Now, you can define a family of metrics like this, and depending on what you put is x of t, you're going to have the speed index, if you're looking, for instance, at the difference in the histogram that were shown, so the colors on the page, you have room speed index that is measuring the areas that each of the different objects that are drawn on the page are going to uh, put, and they're going to compare it with the amount of rectangle that should have been drawn at the end. You can look at SSC and PSSI perceptual speed index using SSC metrics, which are much more advanced. So all of that is very good because is visual progress, but there are downsides. So for instance, you can only measure them in browsers, and some of them are actually process intensive. So if you need to do SSC, there's a lot of computation you need to do. So some years ago, we were proposing to do, as a proxy of these more advanced metric, they have very simple inputs like object index or bytes. Just looking at the bytes that are coming, you would get a pretty decent idea of what is coming uh, to your browser, if it's coming fast or not. We're going to see a little bit later if it's work or not. Uh, good side is that you can do it in layer 3 in the network. It's correlated with speed index. Doesn't necessarily uh, is good for creative experience. So that's a question that you, you need to uh, address. And I'm not going to go into these kind of details, but uh, you can also have uh, uh, affecting, for instance, the cutoff of the integral in order to uh, optimize some of those metrics. But I'm not going to go into these details. 
So now, if you are in the browser, or if you are a content service provider, what you have is that you have a pretty good picture of everything that is happening. You have per domain, a vision of all the different objects, uh, also the type, if there are the images or not, CSS, whatever. And you can reconstruct this picture uh, with quite uh, accuracy. Now, if you are in, a, uh, in the dark, so if you are an ASP, if you are an equipment vendor, what you will see is basically a series of packets coming from different flows. And the only thing that you're going to read is that, okay, this, uh, this is a packet. This is a packet, full packet size, MTU, and this is a smaller one. So what do you make out of it in order to uh, extrapolate from this? So again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I'll let, uh, rather going to show you uh, why this thing could work. But basically, the idea is if you are familiar with machine learning, you need to uh, perform some amount, uh, some really simple amount of signal processing in order to make your input to be homogeneous. We're using supervised technique. So supervised technique means that we need to have exactly the same input. Uh, and then different uh, models that you're using, uh, like extreme gradient boosting, which is an ensemble method based on trees, or 1D convolutional neural network, what we do is that we present them with a lot of samples, and we tell, look, this sample, uh, and we also explain them, for instance, had this above default value. Uh, we build another model providing the same example and providing what is the page load time or the speed index of any metric that you're interested, and we provide many samples to train a model, and we test it over previously unseen cases. To give an intuition why this should work, so here we have the web page rendering, so this is basically the user. Here is what we see in the browser, where every burst is going to be one object, and we have one color per different domain. Actually, we're presenting only the top three domains, and the others we are using the same color, otherwise the picture would be really, really too colored. And here, we, this is what you see from the network. So we're going to have one packet, a little bit more, we are aggregating packets in 10 milliseconds, and then you're going to see one color per IP server. So when I'm starting, if I click on the right place, you see that, okay, now this is a Chinese web page. So it starts uh, late at some point. You see those things are progressing. Here there was a big object. This big object has been allowed in multiple packets. Same thing here. The green packets correspond to this big object. And you see that these curves are slightly different. But you see that there is some similarity, right? They are not completely uh, different. And indeed, uh, if you systematically perform this experiment, this was just one example to show you how these things look like in, for real, then you can go and make an experiment where you're monitoring the network, so you're taking the real encrypted traffic. You are monitoring the browser, so you have the ground truth, so you have the above default, whatever metric you're interested in, and you can repeat uh, this process and uh, try to see, uh, extrapolate some accuracy number. So here this is the only accuracy uh, picture that I'm going to show. Uh, this is reporting the absolute error in milliseconds. Actually, this is the median, and this is the 25th percentile, and this is the 75th percentile. So in, this is basically, in the 75th per case, your error is going to be much lower than this, and in the median case, it's going to be this one. And you can see here we have two different approaches. One is, we, even without machine learning, uh, I'm not going to explain why, the colors before in the picture had a mathematical interpretation. But I didn't want to bring it up today. It's not the point. But with an algorithm based on that, we can have already something that is going to learn only a single uh, function, which is the byte index. Uh, and we can approximate the byte index learned from the network with the, approximate, with the uh, application byte index that we learn in the browser. And that one has a 6% error. On top of that, uh, this is without machine learning, so it's a very simple online algorithm. On top of that, you can add machine learning and you can compensate for, for this error. So you can reach a lower error and then you can learn generalized to any metric. So we're learning the page load time, the object index, the speed index, or room speed index, the DOM, if, you, if you're interested in learning the DOM, with these kind of errors. So we did test uh, with Orange on a uh, number of uh, pages that we were never seen before, in number of networks we were not seen before, and these are the accuracy estimated indeed in those settings, so it's uh, pretty good portable. And, okay, uh, not to make an advertisement, but given that the algorithm works, we are all supporting it into uh, Huawei products. Now, there was one catch that I didn't talk in this talk due to lack of time, uh, is that we are also able to handle multi-session. So in, if I go back here, we see that there are a lot of packets coming from a lot of different um, flows, but you need before to be able to isolate the flows that are going to go to the same session. So this is something that you need in order to be able to apply your machine learning technique, and it is also something that is done, but we just didn't talk uh, in for lack of time now. So basically, after, OK, now is where we stand. So where we could go to go further. So I'm going to just uh, talk about three, three, couple of free ideas. 
So for people that are familiar with machine learning, unfortunately, in the WebQE domain, we are still at expert-driven feature engineers. So basically, we have somebody that is defining speed index, and why should be defining speed index? Seems a very natural and very bright idea, but we have no clue whether this is really uh, a proxy for quality of experience. So a better approach, I'm not saying more explainable, so it's less intuitive, would take raw input, raw sensory data from the user, and try to do what? To learn the features by the learning process. The learning process is gonna, in the neural network, through an atom, uh, through back propagation, is gonna create some features that are the most relevant in order to find and explain uh, what the, why the user voted a given score, okay? So that's definitely not interpretable, it's more versatile. The downside it is requires a lot of sample, okay? So here what we did uh, was taking packets and learning any of these functions. Similarly, we could use these inputs and trying to learn uh, functions which are user happiness. Of course, getting the data is difficult because you would want to be as less intrusive as possible. So if you need to put sensors like this, maybe you're affecting the user experience. And other thing is that maybe, okay, you can leverage, uh, so I know people that are working on uh, happiness recognition through facial recognition, but over there, if you're happy, it may be for the content of the message that you receive or the page that you're visiting and not whether the experience in your loading that page was, was happy, was good. So it's quite difficult to get the sensory part working. Second thing is that I was speaking about single model, and actually we did single models because they are easy deployment. But, uh, of course, World Wide Web is really, really large. So, for instance, Wikipedia is not, is not image intensive, and you will have other websites that are mostly done by images or video. So how can a single model fit all? So, of course, to increase accuracy, you should go per, per, mod, per, per page. Here, just an example picture where you have black line is one average model, uh, and these are all the points that you're getting. And, of course, if you have many per page model, they're gonna be they're going to have a better fit. Now, the problem is that inherently this process is not scalable. So how to make it scalable? Well, by prioritizing things that are more important. For instance, if you have top 100 web page, you can build a reliably model for the top 100 pages that are more frequently visited by, by people. Uh, then you can have a second approach in which we, we cluster uh, the top 1 million web pages. For instance, here you see number of clusters out of which 24 pages were extracted. And inside each, each of these clusters, there are thousands of pages. This cluster have similarity in terms of the number of domains, the number of objects, and the size of the page. So there are higher chances that if you build models that are accurate for pages in this class, then you're going to also be able to cover more accurately the top 1 million. And then, of course, okay, for the rest, the top 1 billion pages, you're going to use a single average model and pray it will work. Uh, but at least you're going to already have uh, in a better operational point in the accuracy versus scalability trade-off. Then, final comment, which is a community comment. If you are working in this space, the fir first thing you need is data. So keep collecting and sharing data is very important. So I'm very uh, happy that uh, finally, uh, we, 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 working with Wikimedia, we were able to release the data set in a properly anonymized form that was uh, protecting successfully the privacy of people and also letting people doing the research in order to build models better than the one we built. So, we, you need to take into account that when you go to the supermarket, you already find this machine, right? And they're asking you, are you happy or not? And you click on it, and you don't think even about it. When you're calling over Skype or Facebook, at the end of a call, there's something that is calling, uh, asking you, rate your call. Uh, also, my phone started asking me, did you find this suggestion useful? So to have binary feedback from him, and this is the same from Wikipedia. So what you would you gain for keeping this date steady data collection is two things. One, you have... Uh, until your model will not be good, you re readily have some information from the user. So you already know if something happens that is users of your service that are telling you directly. And you don't need to go over Twitter and try to understand if the user are complaining about your service through other channels. Second, this continuous stream of data is going to also uh, be able to uh, make your model better. Or if there's anything that changes, next protocol. So we had the HTTP2, now it's going to be HTTP3 sooner, sooner over, HTTP, over quick. Ah. Uh, maybe your model needs to be retrained, so you will need to have this kind of data. And if the user population is large enough, there are also limited downside. Only it, it is a risk of annoying users if you are uh, having a small, um, uh, if you leverage pan small panels. So without, uh, so this is basically a talk that is based on uh, these resources here. I put uh, uh, the different uh, papers. I put also the icons for the different data set. Some of the uh, implementation that we release and everything is accessible from, uh, from here in this page. Uh, there are things that are not out yet, uh, so more will come. 
So for with all this, I think that I, I'm done. So I would like to thank you for listening so far. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. If you, if you shout, I can also repeat the question. So like. uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, is there any chance that some uh, government guys can say that all this uh, research has no sense uh, if they like will have the encryption keys of every internet? I mean. Yeah. No, okay. So there there are studies also. So the the question is. What, what if I'm able to break the key? So what you're doing things about the encrypted stuff where you can break the encryption. So government guys, so there, there are two, two answers. So if you're having the, if you're able to decrypt, probably you're not interested in web performance. So you're breaking this in order to look at different uh, information. Second, there was a study, uh, Usenix, uh, telling you what is the fraction of in data. You, you, you got proxies, for instance, in, in some of the institutions, you have a proxy and you're delegating and you're accepting the key. And in a PC that is managed by your organization, indeed, you have a proxy so for which it is not necessarily useful. Now, in GDPR, this is pretty serious now. So definitely, if you are Huawei, there is going to be twice as more concern as if you are a regular vendor uh, right now in this moment. And so, of course, I mean, having that your uh, devices are totally not interested in looking at the payload because they don't need it, okay, it's much more important. So here, basically, what we are doing is that we are leveraging very weak signals that are intrinsically in the timing information that comes in packets. Uh, much like, uh, I mean, Debussy was saying that the music is the silence between the notes, right? So here, in somehow, we are waiting the information that we see, even if you are not listening to the notes, not looking at the content, to try to reconstruct the signals. The thing that I was showing today was not for the government, was more for in the internet service provider and uh, um, uh, well, equipment vendor, but if you go up to the Chrome uh, browser, for instance, they still the, the missing link is between the layer seven and the layer eight, the user. So, how do you, you, you can you sh ensure that, for instance, there will be a talk on normalization of uh, timing APIs? So, you want to normalize something that is relevant for the user, right? So, and this is the part where indeed it fits from going from normalizing that from a uh, level seven point of view, and if it's relevant, we can learn it also from layer three without breaking an encryption key. Don't know if it clarifies or... Yeah. Are there seasonal effects which affect the, the, the perception of the end users? Okay, so that's, a very, yeah, yeah. so that's a very good question. So actually it's seasonality, so basically things that are non stationary over time, and particular seasonality means that there's periodicity. It's something that we look out, uh, we, we ex extensively look out in, the, uh, that, in data sets. Um, for instance, with Wikipedia, we have a uh, measurement of months worth of studies. So we were expecting to find day-night effect, weekend, weekdays effect. We didn't find any about the happiness of the user. It was amazingly stationary during the period. Uh, so th this is documented in the paper, and we also extended that. Still there, I don't know why there's no seasonality. We were expecting it. The data now is available, so uh, yeah, I think this is much... Uh, Okay, so that's basically, I, I went very, very fast. Can you um, repeat the question? Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question when I come to here. So basically the question is, okay, what is the magic? How can you learn from the, the packets? And actually, we're not learning directly from the packets because every web page has a different number of packets. And our supervised method, which are regression method, need to have a fixed input. So what we're doing is basically that we are chopping the time into regular interval. Uh, of times, and what happens is that basically you are pe sampling periodically a signal. You're sampling it periodically this signal when you are every so often, every delta t, you are looking at the packets that come, put an integral there, and you're basically sampling this uh, curve here, right? So this is uh, the way in which we get the input, which is by just accumulating over small period fixed time, time arrivals uh, packets that belong to the same session. And that's what's make the, the input. So there's the basic signal processing level amount of feature engineering.
to normalize your input to be able to uh, fade it to a neural network. And okay, four minutes left, so I was too fast. So you can, sorry guys. You have a question, okay. Uh, Cool, I can ask directly in the microphone. Um, do, you, do you have an estimate of how many data points we collected on Wikipedia in like a typical week during the study? Uh, how many data points we collected in a typical week during the study on Wikipedia? You're a typical week. So n now I know that basically um, finger change a bit, so I think I have some backup slides. So too many backup slides. So this is okay, about the stationarity, you get your, your picture there, which is here. So I know that we were collecting the 62,000 uh, data points during the first period, which uh, was basically a first test case in which we were, so if I remember correctly, uh, web performance timing are triggered at once every 10,000 page visit in Wikipedia. And out of those, we were sampling one over 1,000 at the beginning. Uh, at the end of that, we step up a little bit, so you, you step up a little bit the, the sampling, but this is basically over this uh, period of time. So hidden is the fact that we basically issued the sample, the, the query to 1.4 million people and only 62K replied. So because people are, uh, they can willingly or not accept to click on those or not. So the numbers per week, um, I don't have them in my mind because we are mostly focusing on can we get a breakdown of how the users are happy. And in this case, in Wikipedia, 85% of the users are consistently happy with uh, no seasonality and no correlation with uh, some events. Okay. Um, I'm wondering um, if we measuring, well, if we measure something like hidden mix and browser, then we can do it because uh, we want to improve the web website and want to see which parts should be improved. What is the intention for mobile? Because this Okay. <coughs> so. We can go back, this is to slide one, which is, so you're here, you want to know if things break or not, right? So if you are measuring indeed from the browser, it's because you are in the browser, or you, because you're a service provider. Now, what Huawei do as a business is basically selling boxes uh, to operators. And operators, what they do is that they sell pipe capacity to their customer, which are the user, and from time to time they have problems because the service doesn't work, and the people will complain to the ISP, but actually it's not the ISP the problem. It may be the content service provider, maybe the DNS, maybe BGP. So over there, basically, there's a need for troubleshooting tools in order to be able to tell, oh, yeah, uh, it's um, uh, our problem, so it's our network that is down, so we're going to fix it. Or, look, guys, uh, everything that we have on our side is okay, but there are a lot of problems on that website uh, everywhere. In order to be able to say so, you need to know what is the typical page load time of your user or detecting whether this, this is changing. So this is why, indeed, before I was working more on the, if you want, layer seven uh, kind of aspect, and there the question was, okay, we have the speed index, okay, we have the above default, but nobody tried to compare whether this was really relevant for the user. So this is where we started involving users. And now this bit about, okay, and then I'm working for in a, a equipment vendor, so am I able to do the same things, but from a more challenging viewpoint, which is starting from completely encrypted traffic, uh, just for, I mean, it, this is research, so it's fun. <laughs> but then, given that I'm no longer in university and I'm in uh, Huawei, there's also business model behind, because basically if you are able to detect whether there is a problem, then you can fix it, and then you will not have user churn, and so you're not losing money, right? So the same thing from the content provider. Why are they optimizing? Because there are ads, except on Wikipedia. So there are, in Wikipedia there's a donation. But if, if you are Google, if you are Bing, if you are Microsoft, if you are Facebook, you, you're showing ads. And you're, this is the way you get money. So if your web page is low, there were studies by Google, by Bing, they were showing that for any amount of milliseconds you add, from hundreds of milliseconds, you have a loss in the number of people that are going to uh, go to the server, click on the ads, and so you have losses of uh, revenue. And if you multiply 2% loss by 1.2 billion people visiting, that's, that's big numbers. So same thing, but from encrypted pipe uh, from the network uh, guys, viewpoint. Okay, so thanks, uh, thanks a lot for- Thank you, David.